So get this. 1444, Ottoman Sultan Murad II signs a peace deal with Hungary, and then decides, that's it, his work here is done, the empire is saved forever, and he gives the throne to his 12-year-old son. Did he want to take it easy and figured his boy could handle himself? Was this some kind of scheme to teach his son valuable life lessons? Was he attempting to develop a Disney Channel original series? We may never know. Whatever the case, the Hungarians noticed, and hardly after the ink on that peace treaty was dry, one of the cardinals was pushing the king to go back to the battlefield. That doesn't sound very Christian. That doesn't sound very Christian! Who's the Jesus expert here? And that's how the tween sultan found himself leading his first war. It would not be his last. So my daughter married Ivan the Third, but my son wrote in his will if I can find it around here. No, but if you go back before the Fourth Crusade... What seems to be the trouble, gentlemen? Ugh. We're trying to figure out who the Roman Empire is supposed to belong to, but we're losing track of all our ancestors, and besides, we don't even have access to all the records we need to know for certain. That's why I signed up for my heritage. Your heritage? No, no, my heritage. The world's number one family history service. They have 16 billion records, so you're bound to learn something new about your ancestors. All you need is seven connections to get started. But sir, I don't know much about my family. Sounds like their DNA test is perfect for you. You could find family members you didn't even know you had. And the coolest part, if you have an old black and white photograph of your grandparents, for example, presto, full color and in motion, bringing history to life with the power of animation. What a concept. I mean, seriously, I've, no, no, I've, paid more than a month's subscription just to get a single image colorized on Fiverr before, and I've had so much fun exploring my family tree in full. I'm actually in touch with a lot of these far-flung cousins, so yeah, I've been into genealogy for a long time. You can access everything for 14 days free at the link on screen or in the description, and if you like it, you'll also get a 50% discount. And now we can finally say for certain that the true inheritor of Rome is- Dad, they're torching the Balkans! You have to come help! You've been a governor for seven years. You'll be fine. Ooh, green one. No, that's not how this works, Dad. If you're in charge, then you need to come lead your armies. If I'm in charge, then I order you to come and lead your armies! Oh. Murad fought and won the Battle of Varna, but it would be two years before he actually came back to the palace to take charge of the government again, which is frankly an obscene level of trust he had in his viziers. But the important thing is that when Mehmed took the throne again as a man, he wasn't just well studied, he'd seen a thing or two. He was also a total nerd who was obsessed with history and classical literature. Wouldn't know anyone like that. Loki idolized Alexander the Great, which, uh, you know, a little basic, just saying. And he spent his days spitballing ideas with his advisors about how to achieve his dreams. What are we doing today, your majesty? The same thing we do every day, Halil. Try to take over Constantinople. They're already our vassals. I don't see the rush to conquer it, because it would be epic! Hello? I could be a Roman emperor! Greater men than we have tried and failed. Attila, the Bulgarians, the Rus, even the great caliphates couldn't breach the walls. They're too thick. Oh yeah, they're thick all right. We've tried like four or five times. If having a massive army and a fortress directly across the strait won't do it, what will? A fortress directly next to the city. Mehmed builds his fortress, he names it the Throat Slitter, just to be extra, and he takes control of the Bosphorus Strait. No one gets in or out without his permission. The Venetians tried to slip one past him, he blew up the ship, beheaded the survivors, and turned the captain into a human scarecrow. Well, they're definitely gonna pay the toll, I tell you that much. Okay, no fleet will rescue the Byzantines. But what about the walls? Just then, a Hungarian engineer wanders in, explaining how he was turned away from Constantinople by an emperor who couldn't afford his services. What kind of services? I want to build a cannon. A cannon? A really big cannon. Your majesty. Uh-uh. I'm listening. 
nearly 20 feet long and heavier than a whale, carried onto the battlefield by 60 oxen. The cannonballs, 100 pounds each. Bigger, 200 pounds. Bigger. Th 300 pounds? Bigger. God be praised! Sign here, and I'll give you a weapon to blast through the walls of Babylon itself! Shut up and take my money! War soon came to Constantinople, and sixty oxen carried the mother of all cannons that fired those mighty rounds over a mile into the Theodosian walls, and the Ottomans hoisted their ships over the very hills to break the Byzantines' blockade, and their men tirelessly dug beneath the city to undermine its defenses, but the city refused to crack until- Hey! This one's open! Well, that was a freebie. All right, hey, you getting this? <clears throat> My soldiers, I once told you either I would take this city or it would take me. Today, Rome is reborn. Today, our empire, presently humbled, did fell the walls of Carthage, rival the Parthians and the Sassanids, repel the savage Huns. Hey, no, this is my day, okay? As my city falls, I will fall with her. What? No, oh, what is this I'm Augustus and he's Antony. Why does he get the epic moving speech? Sad though it was to see the end of 2,000 years of history, and as brutal as the attack was, make no mistake, there was lots of theft and murder and other words I'm not supposed to say on YouTube. Funnily enough though, the city itself really started popping off after the Ottomans got a hold of it. In 1453, there were about 50,000 people in a city designed to hold 10 times that. Within a century, it had fully rebounded and become the most populous city in all of Europe again with a little help from forced relocation. And while the Hagia Sophia got turned into a mosque, which means for once I don't have to keep cropping out the minarets and the Islamic symbols and Arabic texts and all these pictures, it remained a surprisingly multicultural city, with Mehmed going out of his way to make sure that Constantinople was still an important site for Christians and Jews who were given a fair bit of government autonomy. After the fall of Constantinople, there were technically a couple Byzantine holdouts. Mehmed actually adopted the city's would-be heirs into the Ottoman Empire, gave one of them a province to govern that was frankly bigger than what was left of the Eastern Roman Empire anyway, and the other became a top admiral and vizier. The last Byzantine Emperor's brothers were holed up in the Peloponnese Peninsula, where Mehmed kind of just absorbed them as vassals until he realized they were just completely useless. These guys were supposed to be the last flickering embers of the Roman Empire. Constantinople was just taken, and their subjects hated them so much that those two nitwits had to ask Mehmed to put down rebellions for them. Then they went and rebelled against Mehmed, and he just went ahead and conquered the whole darn place. And so the last of our lands is taken, but I swear before God, the Emperor of Rome will return! Ha <laughs> ha! Indeed I shall! What? What? I was talking about me. I'm the next oldest. Y yeah but I'm the guy with the fancy hat in Constantinople ruling over Roman lands. You took it by force! Yeah, so did your family. No, that's different. They came from inside the Empire. Anatolia used to be inside the Empire. No, no, no. No royal ties, foreign army, totally different culture and religion. What about if your family died and you had no heirs to give the title to, huh? I'd probably give it to the Spanish. Excuse me? But technically, another piece of the Byzantine Empire still existed in a way. You see, there was this kingdom called Trebizond, one of the tiny little kingdoms that popped up after the, uh, Crusader incident. And it was still ruled by the Komnenos dynasty, who used to be in charge of the Byzantine Empire way back in the day. Trebizond was ruled by a man named David. In a story that should sound somewhat familiar, David's older brother John spent his last years on Earth searching for allies. He mustered up support from King George of Georgia. David asks Mehmed if he can lay off the yearly tribute. Mehmed says, I'll give you my answer later. What the hell is that? I think that's his answer. So this is it. The Komnenoi, rulers of this land for centuries, are finally to surrender to the hands of the Turks. Oh, what a shameful end for the inheritors of Rome. Uh, 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 
nope, nah. -uh. You see this? I'm Caesar. Caesar wears a turban? He does now. Or what, you think the Spanish have a better claim? I mean, I was just gonna lament about how the line dies with me, but, I mean, if it had to be someone, it would be the Russians, wouldn't it? The Russians? Well, obviously, it's not a perfect analogy, but, you know, Orthodox country, historically, the Rus had a lot of marriages to the Emperor's families. Jesus, prophet, what's a guy gotta do to be a Roman these days? And so that, totally, definitely, was the last scraps of the Byzantine Empire, all squared away. But, uh, they don't call this guy Mehmed the Conqueror for nothing. He got into a tiff with Serbia, which brought Hungary into the war, which is how this guy, John Hunyadi, who wasn't the king of Hungary, but may as well have been, found himself in the city of Belgrade with the Ottomans at his doorstep, and no help coming from foreign kingdoms. This city, he said, emerging from time immemorial, has looked up at the whole world, invaded by the Celts, trampled by the Roman army, ravaged by the Huns, point taken. Except this time, what should appear on the horizon but an army of foreign peasants, moved by the plight of the Serbs, who'd personally taken to arms and trekked hundreds of miles to unite behind Hunyadi and defy the Ottomans, no matter how slim the odds. Taken by the Ostrogoths! Recaptured by the Byzantines! Nobly sacked by the migrating Slavs! Besieged by Bulgarians, generally knocked about by the aforementioned powers in recent centuries. But to be taken by the Ottomans is a step too far! Constantine XI was no doubt rolling in his grave. Or wherever his body ended up. Hunyadi was able to defend the city with his influx of volunteers and a fleet of 200 ships along the Danube. But that said, Mehmed did end up conquering the rest of Serbia. Believe it or not, we're only seven years out from the fall of Constantinople. All of these wars were overlapping between 1454 and 1460. But as they were all drawing to a close, there was one place that was still giving him trouble, and he would have to attend to it personally. Wallachia was a buffer between Hungary and the Ottomans, so they were constantly dethroning and rethroning its rulers. The new guy in charge is Vlad III, Dracula. <laughs> It's the usual story. Mehmed demands tribute. European leader says, I can't pay right now. Only... So Mehmed was like a Greco-Roman fanboy. Flair for the dramatic. Vlad was... I have to get out ahead of this whole segment by saying that sources are conflicting. And a lot of this is just stories that came out of the war that are wildly exaggerated or even just made up. But Vlad is like... If an edgy, misanthropic 12-year-old wrote about the things he would do if he was a king. Equally dramatic to Mehmed, but way darker, and arguably less creative. Mehmed sends his envoy to collect tribute, and Vlad sends back their corpses with their hats nailed into their skulls. Mehmed sends in his army, and this is where things get messy, but a version of the story looks something like this. Mehmed tries to set up an ambush, but Vlad finds out and ambushes the Ottomans instead. Vlad then retreats to his capital, burning all the crops and poisoning all the wells along the way. The Ottomans are low-key terrified because any time they break apart from the main army, they get picked off in the night and are never seen again. Vlad then sneaks into the Ottoman camp himself, huge grain of salt there, and finds out where the Sultan's tent is, and then either brings in his whole army the next night and attacks the camp trying to assassinate Mehmed, or he comes in with a smaller force that are all disguised as Ottoman soldiers, so even though they're outnumbered, the Ottomans are so panicked that they start stabbing each other in the back. But the creepiest part comes either just outside the capital city of Targovishta, or creepier still, when the Ottomans arrive at the capital and find the gates wide open. They're walking down the main street and there's virtually no defenses. The place is a ghost town. Until up ahead, they see a column of men standing against them. The Ottomans presumably order their soldiers to take attack formation, but Vlad's men don't move. And then they realize, those aren't Vlad's men, they're Ottomans. It's a field a mile wide and four miles long of 20,000 dead Ottomans impaled on spikes. Presumably, Mehmed was thinking something along the lines of, 
Oh my god, human scarecrows, who would do a thing like that? Followed by, wait a second, how? That must be like every casualty we've suffered so far, did they? Like, during the battle, were they going out of their way to pick up every single corpse? At some point after this, the Ottomans noped on back to Ottoman land, and the Wallachians dethroned Vlad by themselves. Win-win! Okay, I'll quickly mention, he took over Bosnia, he reconquered a lot of Anatolia, invaded Moldavia, but didn't conquer it, there was a war with the Venetians that was probably important, but no one had a dramatic speech about the fall of their kingdom, and oh, Albania. What's that? This is a collaborative video? Sick, alright, tag out, you're watching Hikma History. Thanks, Jack. Skanderbeg is one of the greatest military commanders you've probably never heard of. In a 25-year grudge match to the death, he led the Albanians to 13 victories over the Ottoman military machine. Using guerrilla warfare tactics combined with his intimate knowledge of the Ottoman military, something he picked up in his 20 years of service to the Sultan, Skanderbeg was able to halt Mehmet Fateh's march into Albania. In a life filled with wars and battles, there are claims that Skanderbeg killed up to 3,000 men personally. Find out more about this unsung hero of history in the video I made about his conflict with the Ottomans over on my channel. Back to you, Jack. Ah, thank you, sir. Look at that, a whole segment I didn't have to animate. If you want a good source of interesting Muslim history, he's your guy. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much Mehmed II for you, except- Oh wait, he took over Italy! Well, not- not all of Italy, just like- one town, but I don't know, I was pretty surprised to find out that the Ottomans conquered even part of it. His admiral seized the heel of Italy, and now, finally, he's got Europe in a real tizzy. Because Constantinople, ah, they were on their way out anyway, they weren't even Catholic. But Ottomans in Italy? Who's to say they won't take over the city of Rome? That is just uncalled for! The Pope's calling on a crusade, you got Hungary bringing in troops, France, Spain, Naples, all bearing down on this one castle. And then Mahmoud got sick and died. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>